evening. Okay. Hi, I'm John Sawyer. I'm the director and founder of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, journalism organization based in Washington, D.C., and we work with uh, news organizations all over the world uh, to do mostly international reporting projects that we think are going underreported in the media. And it's such a thrill for us to be here and be associated with this event tonight. Uh, I came here back in June for a, a gathering of, of, of journalist organizations, and, and I got to meet Henry and Diane and, and see this um, amazing facility and, and the community that it's part of. And I, I went home and I told my colleagues and my wife, Kim, who's with me, who also works at the Pulitzer Center, we have to come back and do something at City of Asylum uh, in Pittsburgh because what they're trying to do, what they are doing, is very much what we at the Pulitzer Center aspire to do. And that, that is to take uh, great journalism on, on the issues that affect us all and then engage the broadest possible public in, in work that we do in, in secondary schools and middle schools and, and universities and community colleges uh, all over the country. And, and we very much want to, to have more of a presence here in, in Pittsburgh. We have had a great presence uh, with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette uh, and the, my old friend David Shribman, the editor there, we've done now four or five projects over the last several years, beginning with a project on Bhutanese refugees coming to Pittsburgh and then another one on Alcoa pulling out of Suriname after decades of economic engagement in, in that country and most recently the project that we're talking about tonight and, and that is the impact of restrictions under the Trump administration in H-1B visas and other parts of immigration policy and, and how it has impacted uh, businesses and communities in cities like Pittsburgh. And uh, we funded work, the travel that, that made, that was part of the project that Melissa McCart uh, did with the, the Post-Gazette, and the Post-Gazette and Melissa uh, did an amazing job in telling this story, as you've seen in what's come out so far and what's coming out tonight for tomorrow's paper as that series continues. And of course, Melissa wouldn't have had such a great story if she hadn't had Mike Chen of Everyday Noodles uh, to be the focus of this story. And Kim and I came last night, and we were able to have dinner with Melissa and Mike at Everyday Noodles. I, can't, I told Mike I can't believe I'm eating again tonight because we had so many fabulous noodles last night. Uh, so you're in for a real treat. I'm, I'm, I bet a lot of people here have already been to Everyday Noodles. If you haven't met Mike and heard his story and, and heard what Melissa did with this, um, they have a lot to share. So with that, I want to uh, call Melissa and Mike and the others up to, to tell their story. And thank you all. <laughs> Don't be nervous. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm Melissa McCart, and I'm the restaurant reporter and critic for the Post Gazette. And as they're getting comfortable, I'll introduce them. We know Mike Chen from Everyday Noodles in China Palace. <laughs> and sitting next to him is Chris Bream, uh, an economist at the University Center for Social and Urban Research at Pitt. And sitting next to Chris is Marianne Lian. She's the executive director for the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition. You might have heard her today on uh, WESA and um, talking a little bit about the Squirrel Hill community. And she's also on um, the Governor's Commission for Asian Pacific American Affairs. So um, if you had read the article that I had written about some of the immigration issues that Mike was having um, with Everyday Noodles, I will not be repeating those. It's quite a long article. But one of the things that I wanted to explore is sort of why I wanted to write this article in the first place. And that is, as an outsider to Pittsburgh, I'm not from Pittsburgh, um, I thought it was really interesting that the Chinese community, especially at the universities, was growing so much. 
And I was curious as to why. And there's so much I can read, but I could also see that it was directly related to my beat in covering restaurants. And the person who talked to me the most about it was Mike Chen. And so I wanted to start a little bit with Mike um, and talking about like when you came up with the idea of everyday noodles and how. Uh, actually, um, I moved from Los Angeles to Pittsburgh over 34 years. I married a Pittsburgher, so I'm here. <laughs> and so you know who's the boss at home. <laughs> but you know, about almost nine years ago, and I have an idea because you know I'm in the food business, and whatever I've done for the Chinese food is what we call American Chinese. So, you know, I own China Palace. You come to a restaurant, you get a grilled general so chicken and such as. <laughs> but myself, you know, I start thinking we always eat dumpling at home, we always eat noodle at home, and. If I want those things, I even have to traveling to Toronto or New York to get those things. I said, why I cannot do myself in Pittsburgh? So we start planning, try to do, and then we try to bring the chef. So around wh what year are we talking about here? So actually we plan and uh, all this project almost about three years. So six years ago, and uh, we open everyday noodles. And we also got the support from Taiwan government because they find me somebody who I can uh, social with them and uh, you know, so they can give me, in recommend me the chef, recommend me the uh, ingredient and uh, some of the equipment and everything. And we also have to, you know, I have some issue about how can bring the talent chef coming to Pittsburgh and give us the real thing. I say, if I don't want to make authentic, real Taiwanese cuisine, I really don't do it. So that's what happened. Um, if we could cue up the video um, that we had filmed about um, noodle pulling at Everyday Noodles. I'm sure a lot of you have been there. Um, this is just a quick um, couple of minute um, refresher. So Mike, what are we, in terms of the dough, are we talking about flour that we buy at the Giant Eagle or what kind of flour are we No, this, this kind of flour you couldn't buy at <laughs> Giant Eagle for sure. <laughs> Um, the flour, actually, you know, because uh, we also do a lot of research. That's include, uh, you know, those three years where we're trying to find the ingredient. Then this flour is bringing from New York, and uh, in a factory, of, of course, is a Chinese factory. They they make the noodle actually um, like this kind of flour. We are using two different kind of flour to mix them together. And it's a, it's like a has more gluten in it, so yes. it's so it's uh, more. It's stretchy. a high gluten and the middle gluten and mix, and uh, you know what they are doing now is, you know, the it tries to twist it, you roll it. Actually, it's almost like pasta machine. You just <laughs> go through it, but what they do is because we want to have a hand touch and. What they roll it for is they push out because all the flour between, they have a little hole and uh, have air in there. So you have to roll it and and also they they, <laughs> they done that. I tried it one time and uh, <laughs> and uh, I done about ten minutes. Next day I couldn't raise my arm. <laughs> But that's what they do, and uh, and this way they're making flour one because we make when they make a thin one and the and the thick one on the noodle. I think a lot of people saw this from TV, and uh, actually the thin one, if they keep pulling it, they're so thin can go through a noodle, a noodle, mm. yeah, and not even break. That's the that's the talent part, because you know. Um, 
I also tried to hire a noodle chef from New York. And they say, of course, they're Chinese. But you know, they say they have like 11, 12 years experience. I said, good. You know, please come, start making. And then they start making, I say, you're fire. <laughs> because they're not even close. And you know. But how do you know? Like, how did you know that he's. Because when they roll it, they pull it, and then you see the noodle and the break in the middle, or they're one, one size wider, one size thinner. And even I give him uh, 10 pound flour, say, I say, how many boats noodle you can come out? How do I know? <laughs> I say, then how can I control my cost? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lot of things. And those kids, what I bring in from Taiwan, of course, they're not here anymore. But they all training from the school, you know, from the, you know, the, the university they have the culinary, yeah, school. the culinary school and all that. So they exactly know, and and that's why, and I mean, those kids coming, I'm so pleased, but of course I'm sad they're not here, because they are very polite, you know, and they they respect the older. Not like a lot of workers, special. I don't want to say they go <laughs> that far, but they really don't care. Okay. Um, <laughs> on that note, um, let's let's look take a couple steps back and um, and if I could direct some questions to Chris, um, it, talk to us a little bit about um, the either rise and plateau or the continued rise of the um, Chinese population and the larger Asian population of Pittsburgh in terms of some some trends that you've been seeing. So uh, I, I only I, you should know with the lights I can't see anyone here, but I don't I th don't think too many friends or colleagues are here. I, I like talking about Pittsburgh, and those of you who've uh, suffered through me before know I, I usually have this great crutch of uh, slides and PowerPoint, and I can just uh, not uh, let the figures speak for themselves. Um, not having that, I thought I would sit here and start with a. I told Melissa I would ignore her opening question and uh, totally uh, <laughs> uh, basically tell the tell tell a story, which really is is far more interesting anyway. And I think relevant here for the, uh, for the uh, uh, given the venue here tonight with the uh, sponsorship by the Pulitzer Center. But um, some of you may know uh, uh, the late uh, Clark Thomas, who was an editor at the Post Gazette for almost four decades. And um, I remember over the years I worked with him a lot or talked to him many times. But 30 years ago, he wrote a book on the um, the uh, immigrant population, the foreign-born population here in the city of Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh. And if you uh, have, a, have a copy of that, I have a copy of it. The, uh, the cover of it is, is sort of what you might have expected for Pittsburgh at the time, which is uh, two Tamboritzans. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, here in Pittsburgh, we certainly uh, identify with this strong immigrant culture. We have neighborhoods that have these strong immigrant identities. But at the end of the day, it's very much a, a European identity. So I don't think uh, Clark or his editors thought much that that was the appropriate picture to put on it. Now the truth was, uh, you know, 1983 or whenever that that was published, um, those Tam Britsons who were there on, dancing on the cover were probably not immigrants to this country. Neither neither were their parents. They were probably the grandchildren of the folks who came here. I mean, the waves of, of Eastern European immigration that really shaped Pittsburgh dates now to a hundred years ago, if not a little more than that. Um, and since then, it has not been the same story. And really, sort of of recent years, I, mean, I, I point out a few factoids always when I talk about growth and change here in the, either the city or the region of Pittsburgh. Um, really, that European immigration, both to the US in general, but to Pittsburgh in particular, you know, has slowed down almost to a crawl. And what has replaced it are, 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 is immigration from many other groups. And just to put how stark that contrast is, recent immigrants into the city of Pittsburgh, about 70% of them, I, I will speak about, we can speak about Chinese, but Asian born in general. Over 75% of, of recent immigration into the city of Pittsburgh um, is from Asia, which obviously includes not just uh, East Asian, but our friends from South, A South Asia, Central Asia. But you know, about a third of that is probably uh, literally Chinese immigration um, in one form or another. But that's how different it is these days. So if you go back and look at um, who we are today, the foreign-born population here in the Pittsburgh region, and by that I mean the whole seven-county metro metropolitan area, 
you'll, what you'll see is because that the different migration flows, the majority of the foreign-born population in the entire region are from Asia now. So, so not European-born. Might have your strong European connections and ethnicities or, or um, identification, but, but really the foreign-born population is not what it's been um, in a long time. So that's change in, in a nutshell. Um, do you see any kind of flux um, from like 2011 to now, or do we not have those numbers yet? Well, you know, I, I, I live in uh, old data, so I mean, uh, you, never, you never really know until it happens. I mean, I, I think the trends have been there for a long time. I, I, don't, I don't quite believe in, uh, in inflection points always. I think this growth has been there. Uh, the, the, uh, the growth that has brought uh, different populations here, the growth in uh, ads and meds in the, in, the, in the industry sector, the growth of the education, the growth of students, some of who stay, some of who don't, but nonetheless uh, has been growing here pretty steadily. Um, you know, for 30 years now. So I think it's, it's a steady and, and continued growth. I don't think there's a sort of one sharp point where you, you, and no one flipped a switch and, and, and things became different here. Okay. Might Thank seem you. that way. But Thank you. Um, so I had met Marion through Mike. And um, Mike, if you can contextualize a little bit the event with a couple of Taiwanese chefs who came into town um, before we went to Taiwan. So a couple of Chinese or a couple of Taiwanese chefs came to town on a circuit. It was like a multi-city circuit um, where they were cook doing cooking demonstrations and sort of unified the Taiwanese community. And Mike, if you want to talk a little bit more about that. No, about uh, four years ago, and uh, I uh, have an idea. I say, we have so many talented chefs in Taiwan. And I want to invite them, came to the United States, and go around to do the demo and teach people and showing people what's a real Taiwanese cuisine. But, you know, I go through the, the ambassador. Uh, I mean, we don't have an embassy, in, but I go through the government of Taiwan in New York. I say, can you help me out? They say, where are you at? I said, I said, Pittsburgh. They say, you know, usually they help me go to New York, <laughs> go to <laughs> California, <laughs> go to Houston, or go to whatever more, like Taiwanese or, or Asian populations mm. city. They don't come to Pittsburgh. I say, please. <laughs> so finally, four years ago, they start doing that. And every year, they keep doing this for four years. They send out two. Uh, famous chef actually this time i think we went to taiwan because that chef coming when when i saw his list they sent it to me he gonna come i'm so exciting because he's almost like iron chef <laughs> in taiwan and he can came to pittsburgh so and then we try to send it out the invitation to invite everybody and come to see the show what they do and of course in the meantime enjoy the food too so I think uh, last time, uh, this, last, uh, this year, Melissa, I invite her and Marianne, we're all there. They make something really is, I've been missed the food for almost 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> so it was at that event that I met Marianne and um, eventually we got together and I had um, asked her a lot of questions for this particular project and I learned her story and I wanted, um, I wanted her to talk a little bit about it with you because she had sort of some comparisons from, when did you, did you move here about eight years ago? Yes, um, so 2011, it was um, on 9-11 actually that we, I landed here, so wow. there I was, yeah. Wow. So talk a little bit about um, how you ended up in Pittsburgh and, and some context between, yeah. uh, or how you got involved in, in um, Asian American, um, sort of advocacy. Absolutely, yeah. So I um, was born overseas, um, so my parents are from Taiwan, and I grew up in Los Angeles in a city called Monterey Park. And for any of you who know Monterey Park, it's actually, the moniker is Little Taipei, right? So Taipei for the capital of Taiwan. So that gives you a little context of what I'm coming from. And so about eight years ago, my husband, um, decided to take a position at Pitt and said to the family, 
Um, and at that point, we were up in Seattle area. We're going to be moving to University of Pittsburgh. And I looked up at him and I said, I know it's in Pennsylvania, but <laughs> honestly, how many Asians are there? <laughs> is there even an Asian grocery store? Please tell me there is. <laughs> And you know, lo and behold, here we you know we moved to Squirrel Hill, and and I have to tell you, um, and, and as I told Melissa, I couldn't be happier because not only do we have one, but we have two, um, you know, Asian grocery stores. Um, in Squirrel Hill, I I know that it's a little different, you know, um, neighborhood-wise than other neighborhoods, um, our other 89 um, in the uh, city. Um, there is a bigger concentration of Asian Americans. Um, so, so not only East Asians, not only Chinese Americans, Taiwanese Americans, but also our South American uh, neighbors as well. Um, I will also uh, th <laughs> share the story that um, there is a big difference between uh, the Asian American community from the West Coast and here. Um, we are very first generation heavy, and so I will say that, which means that the interpretation of our identity is not yet at Asian American, right? So we're still very much here um, uh, looking at ourselves as Chinese American, Taiwanese American, Korean American, um, Indian American. Um, in the West Coast, because there's been many, many more generations going through the system, understanding, you know, what um, politically what this means, they've taken on um, that particular identification. So, yeah. So, um, talk to me a little bit about um, some of your work, both in the um, Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition and working with the mayor's office in terms of Welcome Pittsburgh. Like, what kinds of um, like be beyond um, like introducing cultural events like the night markets and um, dragon boat races. Talk to me a little bit about what you're doing in that regard. Um, so um, yes, um, you know, Mike was right. There's a critical mass right now that um, is asking for that authentic taste. And we've now come to the point um, in our evolution as it were to be um, we'd like to uh, showcase the positivity, right, of, of who we are. So, you know, um, yes, we, we have been doing, you know, the Lunar New Year celebration um, that, you know, that we have, gosh, everyday noodles, and then there's Chengdu Gourmet, there's now a Northeastern um, restaurant. Those are speaking to the authentic flavors. I, I you know, uh, my daughter, um, um, who, who's at Pitt right now, came home and said, she said, Mom, let, let's go and get some chicken gizzards. You know, so, so I mean, <laughs> that says a lot about, you know, being upfront and saying, this is what I miss, which speaks to me about um, this idea that we need to do more. Um, uh, uh, and we're doing the right thing, sharing with our, our um, children um, and our community that these are... Um, absolutely things that we should be proud to do and, and, and keep up doing. Now, um, speaking to your question directly, Melissa, um, <laughs> particularly after Tree of Life, you know, in Squirrel Hill, um, that atrocity, you know, left many of us thinking about what is it exactly we're doing uh, to ensure that our communities are speaking to each other in a way that we're supporting one another. Uh, making sure that um, communities like the Chinese American community, Taiwanese American community, as well as other um, underrepresented communities are not left in the shadows and then fully integrated into the greater community. And so that's something that, you know, um, I'm very proud to say that in the, the coalition, we make sure to have programs that address these things. Um, in the mayor's office, there is a, a welcoming committee overlooking um, such things, um, lo overlooking job prospects for them, overlooking um, the integration of, of our kids, you know, making sure that um, if there are any bullying, um, addressing these sorts of issues with them. And then of course with the governor's commission, um, looking at you know, policy. How do we ensure that um, this particular group, as diverse as it is, um, can still be able to thrive? 
Um, are you hearing um, stu either students or residents talking about, like, I'm, I feel like I'm going to have to leave or making the choice to leave because of the um, environment politically? Or um, are there groups in uh, the community that are helping assuage people's fears? You know, this is the funny thing about Pittsburgh. I think it's like the, the best kept secret, right? Um, so on the one hand, folks will say, oh my gosh, you're going where? And then when they come to visit me, they say, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You know, and, and that's what we're seeing with some students, right? They, they go through and they get their degree, and I will tell you, they all line up around the corner asking me, where can I get a job? I want to contribute to this very, you know, community that has helped give me these opportunities. And, and they are talented individuals, folks. Um, we, we've got to do better to make sure that we spend all this resource educating them and, and then to keep them. And they want to stay. Um, I would also say that, you know, instead of saying that they are feeling like they're being pushed out, that's not what I'm hearing so much as um, I'm hearing the pressures, right? So, so from the administration, we're hearing um, some of these students are now unable to get um, beyond the one-year visa, where it used to be students were able to get the F1 at five-year increments. Um, so since last year, those have changed into one year. Now you can just imagine for our PhD students what that might mean, having to go back to China, to Taiwan, um, to then have to wait. Will they be able to renew their visa? That, that's, a, that's a conundrum for them, right? So then now you have to think, would they then choose to come to the United States for that very reason? Or should they go to Canada? Should they go to another Western country that would ensure that they'll be able to finish off their, their degrees? When we were in Taiwan and um, I had been talking to a couple of different restaurant owners, um, a lot of like 30 something restaurant owners have children and they are either in high school or middle school or what have you. And they are sending their kids abroad to learn English. And rather than sending them to the US, they're going to New Zealand or Australia um, because, because the environment you know, from abroad looks as it does right at this minute. Or in another case, um, I had talked to a government employee who had said that he advised his son, instead of doing study abroad in the US, to go to Beijing. And, um, and in part, it was because you know what opportunities would be available for his son if in fact it led to some kind of a job situation would that be something that he could pursue um, I I'm curious about what some of you might be interested in asking and I wanted to open up the floor to questions if if you would like to ask I'm a manager in IT, and we've had several employees who applied for H-1B, and two years ago was no problem. But now there's quotas, so I have fully qualified employees who have contributed, I can't tell you how much, to our organization, and either they're trying to get student visas to continue getting their master's or PhD, or they have to go back. And it's because of Trump that the H-1B quotas have been eliminated or reduced for Asians, both for Indians as well as Chinese. And the only way we can do something about that is to do it politically. So until those quotas go up, even though they're well qualified for positions and in positions where they're needed, because we can't find Americans to fill those positions with those qualifications, they have to go back. So we have to do something to change the H-1B quota process as well. Thank you. And I'm wondering, what is the university doing about that? <laughs> <laughs> Another department, I hate to yeah, say. Exactly. <laughs> we, need, we need a lawyer here. Yes, I, I have the same problem like that, you know, because I bring my chef coming in, you know, that's also use H1B visa, but because two years ago Trump changed it, so I have to send them home. And actually for the past two years, I, uh, because they couldn't come in, so I have to send my head chef, give him a special vacation 
like twice a year, each time go, go home for a month to learn some new stuff and come back to teach all the other chefs. So when I talked to the woman who was my source in the article, um, Alan Freeman, and I wish she were here because she's fantastic, but um, she, I had told her Mike's, Mike's situation and she knew immediately how to navigate it. And um, she, I, I think that one of the issues is figuring out which lawyers have um, can help can help people in different industries navigate it. And so one of the things that I was learning is that H-1B might not have been the best visa for restaurant workers, but one of the reasons why I called this woman um, Ellen is because um, is because um, we covered a story on the chef from um, Gabier Jules who was um, having visa issues and he was worried about being deported and she had been his lawyer and she sort of deftly navigated the situation and was able to talk about like why that might not be applicable now and how much paperwork people have to read through to figure out the new laws and what have you. And um, she was great in terms of helping um, me better understand what Mike's situation was and how the scenario had changed even since 2017. No, Ellen Freeman. I, I did talk to her, but for the future wise, I really still need, I, I want to bring more talent to chef, especially come to Pittsburgh. You, I mean, you talked a little bit to me um, last week about how you were, what you were doing in the meantime. So, what are you doing with your young dumpling chef? <laughs> you no, know, that's what we we have to uh, training them, you know, and you know to to fold those dumpling. Of course, it's not the dumpling you're eating tonight. It's a, my specialty. It's a soup dumpling. Soup dumpling. <laughs> Soup dumpling is not the dumpling in the soup. It's a soup inside the dumpling. So, so particularly those dumpling, you know, I asked them to fold it 18 times on the top. Why 18 times? If one time's too much, like 19 fold, then they become too thin on the bottom. They'll break. But you fold it for 17, the top become too thick. You put it in your, your mouth, you feel like a little bit hard, not too easy to swallow. It. So 18 times perfect, 18 fold. So when you use your chopstick to take it off, they won't broken and still hold up the soup and put it in your mouth. So you want to teach those young chefs to make that. Sometimes they just always cheat on me. So because when I turn my back, I say, how many times? He said, 18. But I say, I look at it. I know exactly. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> but we do the best we can now because, thank God, those chefs, when they're here, they're teaching those kids. And those kids are really patient, want to learn. This state of most trouble is those young people, they really don't want to learn. So are some of those becoming crossovers to noodle pulling? Yeah, you know, because we're, we're, yeah, we're <laughs> we still have a lot of fresh, you know, kids. Like, so that's why we have to have some, some experienced chef in there to cross it and to, to teach them make. Actually, uh, I'm training two new uh, noodle pouring chef. Uh, you know, they usually in the restaurant, they make cutting and all that, but uh, Wednesday and Thursday night, they they want themselves, they want to stay and learning noodle pool, stay in the restaurant for another hour. I appreciate that. Do you watch them or do they just? No, I'm too old, I go home. <laughs> no, no, my, actually my chef, I mean, you know, my noodle chef is in there to teach them. And so that's, I appreciate that because it's not that easy. But in the meantime, of course, they know when they learn how to pull the noodle, then they got more pay, that's for sure. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions?
Hello. Um, so East Asian food, Chinese American food, or Chinese food, Taiwanese food, all the different varieties rely on the ingredients, right? Um, and so you mentioned a lot about recreating authenticity in the food. Um, but a lot of those cultures rely on getting the freshest ingredients based off of local um, kind of surroundings to create that most authentic taste. So for you, how is it more important for you to recreate as close as possible to the place of origin or to get the food, which is local in some ways, to Pittsburgh to recreate a, a new taste in some ways? I'm, I'm so happy you you asked me this question. So that's also explain why I cannot, when, when we want to make a, open a, this, re this kind of restaurant, we couldn't open right away. And because uh, the chef I bring from Taiwan that time, they're very, very, very picky. And so first, at the beginning, we're not planning to open. Of course, you start looking for the ingredient, well, whatever we have, we can find in Pittsburgh. So when the, my meat delivery bring the beef, they look at it, they say, uh, that's not what we want. You don't believe how many <laughs> supply I find for them, not good enough. So right now, actually, our beef, our tendon, is all sent from New York. It's sent over twice a week. Our fresh vegetable, Thank God, right now we have three decent uh, Oriental grocery store in the Strip. Then they also bring in fresh vegetable twice a week, one time from California, Los Angeles, one time from New York. So that's what we're going to get our supply. And I mean, of course, you cannot say we cannot get anything from Pittsburgh, but the particularly things just not gonna happen. Everything have to go to New York. Yes, I just wanted to ask maybe each one of you can, uh, I'm right here. Where are you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, right here. Um, basically, as I look at Squirrel Hill, I grew up in Squirrel Hill. I was born 1944 in Squirrel Hill. My father moved from the Hill District where most of the Jewish people lived. And at one time, Squirrel Hill was 95% Jewish. You'd go down the streets, you'd see some of the finest bakeries, some of the finest delicatessens that we had. You can't even find that now in Pittsburgh. What I'm really curious about is why the Asian population moved into Squirrel Hill. When my wife and I walk by, we're, we're looking for something Jewish. It's very hard to find it now. <laughs> it really is. And basically, there's so many Asian restaurants there, which I love. I'm not going to, you know, when we were growing up, there was one restaurant. I don't know if anybody knows it, on Kelly Street in Homewood. And that's where we went for Chinese food, I mean, every weekend. And it was filled with Jewish people. So that's why I want to know. Why in Squirrel Hills? Because of the universities are there? Uh, what's the reason why all of a sudden the Asian population exploded in Squirrel Hill? Because I say Jewish love Chinese food. I'll be less funny. Um, no. <laughs> but, so let's talk about Squirrel Hill in the context of Pittsburgh just for a minute. I mean, um, you know, this is a large college town. I mean, not just Pitt, CMU, Duquesne, all these schools that happen to be Chatham. I mean, are all close to Carlo, Chatham, close to uh, Arlington, Oakland, close to Squirrel Hill. It's a very easy commute. But just to put this in context, you know, I, I already gave you the number for how many uh, recent immigrants are Asian. But where are they? Why are they here? Most of it is 40% uh, of the city of Pittsburgh, of young adults in the city of Pittsburgh, are enrolled in college. So I mean, we are bringing folks here. They they often leave, which is true of all big college towns, and they are very much going to be located close to what's bringing them here, which are the universities. So Squirrel Hill happens to have that quick and easy corridor. I, I say the most diverse place. In, in context, there aren't a lot of other Im immigrant groups in Pittsburgh these days, and so we sort of are losing some of that diversity. But I say the most diverse place in the city of Pittsburgh is probably a 61C <laughs> inbound to Oakland at about 8 in the morning, <laughs> you know, uh, if, you, if you can get on. Um, and so, I mean, I think that proximity is certainly uh, all of it. If not for the students, certainly the universities are ones that are the major hires of a lot of these 
uh, folks coming in, uh, direct hires from overseas and, and going forward. So I think that's the story of, in context of the Jewish population, which is like all uh, second and third generation or, or even more groups have, has, has spread out, right? That it's been well documented of late. I mean, it's not that they've all gone, they just exist across the, the broader region, which is true of almost all the other uh, historic legacy uh, immigrant groups here in the city of Pittsburgh. And we'll see one person from Squirrel Hill. <laughs> well, so this is anecdotal. I, I haven't asked Chris to help me look at the data. But I could tell you that you know what we're hearing is that as the Jewish population, you're all so successful, darn it, and your kids become professionals, and so they're not as interested in opening a storefront, right? And so is, this is the um, historical story of immigrants, right? So what are they going to do? They're going to be seeking um, jobs that are going to be um, the least language intensive for them to be successful, right? So that's your restaurants. That's going to be, you know, um, and, and you know, I was telling um, <laughs> Melissa that for the, the Asian population, it's almost like they, everybody knows their lane and they know which lanes they're supposed to be in. So a lot of the Chinese will take up restaurants, you know, and South Asians have in Squirrel Hill have taken on, you know, um, owning the, um, the, the newspaper stands and, and um, the variety stores. Um, and then, you know, we have a couple of um, the, um, let's see, our South, uh, our, our Korean um, Americans have um, own our own, uh, they own the uh, dry cleaners um, there. Um, and so, you know, I, I will say also, it is the only place I know that you can get kosher sushi. You know, I mean, how wonderful is that, right? Um, we still have, um, you know, the only kosher um, grocery store in, in the region, so, so that, that's still there. Um, but I would also say that there's, there's a lot of crossover now um, that's coming back and forth, and, and I still kid with Mike, and I said, hey, you know, it's gonna be, t you know, you're going to be leading the way into getting us some kosher chicken soups, and, you know, <laughs> Chinese <laughs> chicken soup, as it were. But I, I don't want to talk a joke, but this is real. Actually, my dad told me, um, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, outside of Chinese community, and you walk in, you see 60% Jewish eating there. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. I... I uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, I, I think Marianne made a really good point about uh, the children of immigrants not wanting to go into the restaurant business, which uh, requires a lot of uh, high, not highly, uh, highly skilled labor to operate a restaurant. Uh, some skilled labor, of course, at the top, but there's a lot of dishwashing and table clearing. But um, I also wanted to make a point that uh, uh, while Squirrel Hill has long been the center of the Jewish community. It's never been more than 40% uh, people of Jewish faith. Uh, it's always been a community of uh, university professors and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and also depending on how you define Squirrel Hill, uh, you have your Catholic par parishes, your Irish and Italian. So uh, I even though we often think of Squirrel Hill as a Jewish community, it's really never had more than, uh, say, 40 or 40% uh, of, of its population uh, to be Jewish. But <clears throat> the, the uh, question that I would like to ask is we've talked about, you've mentioned your particular problems getting skilled, particular skill, skilled people uh, through the uh, visa program or uh, through the uh, immigration. Uh, right now, the, uh, our immigration and national policy is capricious and whimsical. Whimsical may be a little bit too whimsical a word to describe it, but uh, what what is a good immigration policy that would be sustainable, that would protect uh, workers in this country from exploitation or uh, from downward pressure on wages, and yet allow a full, rich influx of the diversity that we need in this country to to uh, continue? What? What is a good immigration policy that you would like to see 
at some point? For me, the fear is this. We bring those chefs coming into the United States. They're not coming in to take somebody's job away. We are creating more jobs, okay? For example, I bring three chefs coming to my restaurant. I have a 20 other employee. They are who live here. I create a job. Of course, for the good policy, I don't ask much. You know, when they're coming in, we can give them a temporary visa or whatever, and, you know, to let them stay long enough to teach our, the people whatever I hire here, they can go home. You know, of course, they, if they want to stay here, they think the United States, the Pittsburgh, is a very nice place. Maybe there's a chance to let them to get a green car or something. So I still thinking is, what's the better way? I'm not a professional. I'm not the uh, immigration attorney or whatever. What I feel is, you know, they always get the wrong idea is, oh, you keep bringing those people coming in, maybe our people is losing the job. No, they're not. And we create more job. That's what I feel. You made a, Marion, you made a comment a few minutes ago that I haven't heard before and I haven't really thought of before either, but it sort of disturbs me and I don't know if I misunderstood it or not, but you indicated that the immigrants from China or from India or from different areas know what lane they're to be in and stay in their lanes. And that uh, disturbs me is how I'm thinking of that. And I would like to think that they could come here and get in whatever lane they want to get in and they wouldn't be told where they're to go and where you can be and where you can't be. Uh, did I misunderstand your comment or is it really the way it is, which in my mind is not the way for it to be? I guess I would challenge you to think, what are we doing as the greater community to encourage them to change lanes? Um, you know, so many times uh, these sorts of opportunities open up to them through family and friends, right? So it's not cheap to come in and decide to open a restaurant and so forth. So a lot of times these individuals are coming in, they may not have the kinds of credit that we think, you know, um, that is so easy that come to us as Americans. So they're, they're borrowing from family and friends to get started. And so, you know, coming into a strange country to them, you know, the, the thing you're going to be doing is you're going to be trusting those that you know. Um, those individuals will be Probably, you know, those who've, um, you know, um, maybe opened um, other restaurants before or their um, family members that are, are needing help that, that can help them open, uh, you know, uh, chains and so forth. Um, you know, are there crossovers? Of course there are. But for the most part, a lot of times what we're seeing is, um, you know, whether it is intentional or not, that that's what we're seeing is happening is the pattern. Um, Marion, when you and I had talked of a coffee, um, you had talked to me a, a little bit about the difference between uh, international students, especially coming from China with Chinese economic boom now, versus how we think of the poor, starving college student. And um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to how the student population might be different in terms of, um, you know, what what. Do they have to get jobs? Are they not getting jobs? Are they buying gate spade bags or <laughs> whatever? Well, what we're seeing um, is that the the generation of students that came, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, you know, um, really didn't have the kind of um, wealth that we're seeing now. And, you know, and that's that's a reflective of the China today too, right? So. Um, those individuals that came, and maybe Mike can speak to some of this as he's been in industry um, a longer time, um, is they did step up and, and they were the wait staff. They, they, you know, they took on some of these jobs. What I'm hearing from some of the um, Asian restaurants um, is, oh boy, we have a, a real problem. We can't find wait staff right now because these young people are not interested 
in these jobs. They are coming with money. They have affluence enough um, to be able to, well, <laughs> be the customers in these restaurants and thereby, you know, demanding that authenticity, you know, in the dishes. Um, so, so that's that big change that we're seeing. Thank you. <coughs> I'm curious. Um, Pittsburgh, outside of the immediate university community, is not always the most international or sophisticated in its appreciation of foreign cultures. And I wonder if, from either an anecdotal perspective or an economic data-driven perspective, if um, restaurants in particular, if they s can serve a larger purpose, um, not just in terms of helping Asian Americans get jobs or integrate here, but the reverse, helping the more traditional Pittsburgher Yinzer become sensitive to and aware of other cultures and, and other peoples? I'll, I'll start just a little bit. I mean, look, I, I think in context, I mean, you have to understand, right? This is not, a, this is a region that is still experiencing this. It's, it seems like a long time ago, and indeed it was, but this loss of, of, heavy, of heavy industry here destroyed job creation here for, for not just a couple years, but for a decade or two, for a decade or two. And so, you know, it, it took away this big job pull. The reason these Eastern Europeans came a, a century ago, this tremendous growth. The city was, you know, growing at this fast rate. And that hasn't been there. And that is still true for, you know, a lot of the recent story of change in Pittsburgh is very much concentrated here in the city of Pittsburgh. In fact, you know, it's a common conversation I have. It's very much concentrated in the East End. People think it's, you know, the growth of uh, housing. You know, we were talking about the, the, the foreign students being of affluence. It's a great mystery these days where these luxury apartments are, or who's filling up these luxury apartments we're building in the East End. And I think a large part of that is indeed the affluence of the student population, which has changed r relatively rapidly. Um, but that change is not replicated, you know, What's the joke in Pittsburgh? We don't cross rivers, right? So cross a river and you won't see the same type of, of change in the West End or, or the Southern Hilltop neighborhoods or far on the North Side. Um, I can't begin to address whether uh, uh, restaurants would be that change agent, um, but I think that, that there's sort of a, there is a synergy going on here in the restaurant scene, I think, in that you know as we started to bring some, it hasn't, it's not been a large number, let's just be clear, of uh, a larger flow of folks into the city, into the region. It is generating a demand for either housing or restaurants or, or you know, a whole range of, of services that weren't there for a long time. And thus, you know, you're, we're, we're, we're perceiving a lot more change than, than we have in a long time. And I, you know, in, in economics, all pricing's at the margin, as, as, as some of you teach people. So, I mean, it's just, we, like the housing, we haven't built a housing stock. We don't have a lot of new housing. Um, I know Lena's here working on that, right? But nonetheless, uh, I think as we've seen a little bit of new demand, you've seen these pressures in, 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 in markets that we haven't seen before. So I don't know. I mean, I think uh, it will probably follow the trend of all. We talked about what happened to the Jewish population, but we're all ethnic groups. I mean, they tended to spread out. They can't, they, you come and you congregate, you tend to move on. It might be a generational change, but, um, but I'm sure that'll happen here as well. Yeah. Um, uh, just as a restaurant critic, it, it seems like um, one of the most obvious comments I get is like, I, I eat too, so why can't I be a critic? And so <laughs> there's like an element of, there's an element of that, um, that like sort of writing about restaurants is like sort of sneaking in and like, like creating, hope, hopefully creating some kind of sympathy or empathy for, you know, immigrant groups. Or you know, people. Who, it doesn't have to be immigrant groups. Anyone who's opening a restaurant. I mean, you think of the late Jonathan Gold, the restaurant critic who just died in L.A. I mean, he, he sort of put Los Angeles's immigrant community on the map through writing about those restaurants. And then my colleague Halby Klein is here, and I think both of us talk a lot about writing about people's stories, so that you know the everyday person who might not have access to, you know, a conversation with Mike Chen about his problems hiring workers might be able to see that in, in the pages of the newspaper. And we hope that it makes some kind of a difference. But also I think, you know, in the situation with uh, Amazon, for example, I mean, it, 
I don't, we're not New York or, or Northern Virginia, so we might have been losing at the front, but not having a diverse population with lots of international restaurants and a, and a rich, vibrant immigrant community certainly can work against the community. And so perhaps if we're continuing to do some soul searching after that particular loss, if you want to call it a loss, some people don't feel like it's a loss, like that's, that's a conversation we can have too. Can I just add, so, you know, Mike started to say that some of his earlier restaurants were American Chinese food, right? So, so obviously it was created for the Western palate. It wasn't for the Chinese palate, as it were. And now, you know, just in Squirrel Hill alone, I, gosh, I don't think we have what, at least four or five, how many regional? Oh, um, we have, what do we have, 14 Chinese restaurants? Right. But I don't know how many, would you would call regional? So there might be secret menus at places. <laughs> 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 it's true. You know, I've walked in a few times, and then they'll be cleaning the apes. Around, you know, so that would bring you the real thing. You know, so uh, but but I I say this because you know there's nothing better than food. You know that makes one feel good and warm inside, and it has been for me anyway, a great conversation starter for those who may not necessarily be Chinese, but you know, it becomes a starter for me to talk about what is authentic about the identity of you know, these individuals, the other individuals, the Chinese individuals and so forth. So it, it, it is, in a way, um, Jim, to your, an answer to your question is, it has been terrific. And then to have individuals like Melissa to really give it you know, elevating it in you know into the the um, um, city's consciousness to read about this and then come and try it has been a godsend. Thank you. Can I, can I apply to be Munch? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, uh, obviously, New York, uh, uh, L.A., the the coastal cities have more diversity than some of the heartland cities in Pittsburgh might not be able to measure up as far as level or diversity of diversity. However, I was born or grew up here, and I'm not that old, but when I was a kid in the South Hills, there, was n there were no Asian restaurants, none. And, and after the um, Vietnamese refugees began to arrive in the mid-70s and early 80s, it exploded. So I would give Pittsburgh credit for having made the fastest progress going from a non-diverse population <laughs> to a very diverse population. Why, who remembers Chinese on Carson? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in matter of fact, um, 20 years ago, um, um, we talked about before, like, you know, 20 years ago, this thing, something happened in Pittsburgh. Uh, Bonhammer, also a hate crime. And he go around to kill, I think, six people. A Jewish lady lived next door from him and go to a Chinese restaurant, kill two people, and uh, uh, African-American and two Indian. And because that things happen, and the Chinese restaurant community, we think we should set up organization try to help out each other so 20 years ago we start great pittsburgh chinese restaurant association today we have 187 member that means 187 restaurant but actually in great pittsburgh all the county included is over 400 chinese restaurant now <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I remember 34 years ago, I moved to Pittsburgh. At that time, I only know the uh, tea garden. I only know Chinatown Inn. And beside that, not zip. <laughs> so, but as a matter of fact, I'm happy I moved to Pittsburgh. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm, my family have a restaurant in California. Los Angeles, and three of my sisters all, and brother-in-law all in the business, and now they are not. 
they all changed the field because the competition. So that's why I say I'm happy I'm in Pittsburgh. Special, <laughs> special I start restaurant 30 years ago. So I really appreciate the support from Pittsburgh. And I even, right now all my family actually, my part of family all still in California. Even my son, before with me in the business, and two years ago he moved to Los Angeles because he just couldn't take the. He said he's burned out. I said you're in business seven years, you burn out. <laughs> I'm, I said I've been in business thirty some years, I'm still working. <laughs> but my wife did ask me, "You're sixty five, when you want to retire?" I said I don't think so. Um, if I'm retired, I stay at home, lie on the couch every day, you're going to kill me. <laughs> so I will keep working. And she say, you think we're going to move to Los Angeles? I say, I don't think so either. <laughs> and it's true. I, I really love this city. And I've been telling a lot of young coming to Pittsburgh, either they change their job and move to Pittsburgh or some other reason, I always tell them this is very nice city. And I think I'm going to live and die in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Uh, on the side. <laughs> um, in relation to the family's funding, uh, startup business like restaurants or dry cleaners. Uh, it made me wonder about uh, startup uh, tech businesses in relation to the Asian population and uh, degree studies in Pittsburgh and wondering where that's at. Is it harder to move in that direction to get startup funding in those fields? Uh, or where does that stand? Are, are you, can, can I clarify the question for a minute? Are you asking whether startup funds for a restaurant are comparable to a startup for a, t a tech? I'm wondering business? about the tech startup opportunities, if oh. they exist, oh. given that uh, a large segment of the population is going through those programs at CMU and Pitt. Do they have opportunities to start businesses in Pittsburgh? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, let's, I, I will not answer this question. <laughs> um, I mean, only for the sake of time, if nothing else, right? I think uh, we don't another three hour program. Um, <laughs> You know, Pittsburgh actually has a problem, right? We are, we, uh, I mean, there is a lot of tech in Pittsburgh. There is very little entrepreneurial tech in Pittsburgh. The stories that you hear, you hear over and over again because they are so rather rare. We bring a lot of students here. I think there is a d dichotomy between the big tech companies and sort of this image of us, you know, yearning to be Silicon Valley and people starting that tech startup in their garage, which you can find few and far between here. The tech story of late in Pittsburgh, which is real, right? Are big tech companies coming here? They're, Google was not a, was not, did not start here. You know, Uber did not start here. These are not entrepreneurial startups here. So there's a, there's sort of an interesting challenge there to tie this into this. I think would be a larger story. But I think, I mean, w I think it ties to the H1B V's issue of people being able to stay. And a lot of those folks, you know, I mean, I, I forget the statistic the other day that you know people often quote of what percentage of tech comp large Fortune 500 tech companies are founded by immigrants. You know, obviously that will be a very different story if the folks that could be the next generation of folks don't get to stay. So I'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, just an anecdotal response. Um, I had been in Pittsburgh for a couple of years and then I went to New York for a couple of years and came back. And I was working for Vox Media and it was a room like this with a couple of different online publications and there was a bank of lawyers in the middle of a room. And you know, we would often have like, ice come and pull aside an Australian employee and take them in a room with his boss and then I disappear for a month and then maybe back or something like that. But in any event, one of the reasons why, one of the purposes of having, one, it's a, it's a larger organization, but also they were helping people navigate their work visas. And I think that one of the issues that we have here is that there isn't a nonprofit, uh, that that sole purpose is doing that right now, that's sort of helping um, international people stay. Um, I think it's 
not necessarily um, beyond the universities. It's something that's not as forward as you might see in a larger city or a more moneyed corporation. Is how do we, you know, how do we keep people here um, in that regard? So, anyone else? I have a question, um, mainly for Mike. I'm wondering. We've been talking a lot about the politics of America and how the administration affects your um, ability to get hires. What about the politics of Taiwan? We just had an election this past weekend uh, where the majority of the DPP lost, as well as the president stepping down as the leader of a party, the KMT one. I'm wondering how does that internal politics affect the way that you are able to run your business, whether it's in talent and the people coming here or in policies of immigration or anything like that? First, I want to say, actually, uh, I'm happy this time because, you know, I just talked to Melissa a few minutes ago about this time, the election of Taiwan. Um, you know, Taiwan have two parties, and one is called Kuomintang, and one is Mijilang. So I don't know how to translate it in the, in the United States. It's almost same like a Democrat and a Republican. But the party, whoever now runs the country, they put a very strong to be independent Taiwan. But why I say that's not going to work because, you know, Taiwan is a very small country. It's not I don't love Taiwan. Yes, ta I love Taiwan. But, you know, we have faced so many pressure and of course, the most pressure is from China, because China always believe Taiwan is belong to them. But you know, the party right now they want to push to independent, and we know that's very hard to be happen. But the old party, they say, let's keep the name as a Taiwan, and China, yes, you still is a China. And we keep the relationship normal, so people can live in both sides. People can doing both, uh, doing business in both sides, and and create an economy. And but the new the president right now, I'm glad he lost because he know this thing's not gonna work. He want to be an independent. So all the people who ever live in Taiwan, you know. People is simple. If you take care of their stomach, you take care of their pocket, everything is easy. But if they couldn't have enough money in their pocket, actually Taiwan before, we always say, oh, everything is made in Taiwan. But this thing is over. Now I think Vietnam even better than Taiwan now. But I just say, so, you know, this is not going to work. So I think this time loss because people is speaking. People is saying, you know, we need to change like before. So that's what they say. But I didn't know, I did I answer your question about whatever people come to United States. We have time for one more question. Uh, hi, we talked a little bit earlier about how um, a lot of the Asian community here are kind of students, higher affluence, not as interested in business, um, and there's not as much broader immigration. Uh, do you think that's unique to Pittsburgh? And if it is, uh, do you think it disadvantages uh, Asian businesses here compared to in the rest of the United States? I can hand in the mic to give you an answer, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think. Back up just a second. I mean, I, 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 that framing of the uh, Asian student population as not being being more affluent and um, not here to sort of do work is not really a, a description of the Asian student population. It's a description of the student population in general, right? The, the students that are coming to uh, our universities here in town, which have gotten better, have grown, are bringing folks in from farther away. They're not local students. Even when I came to Pitt some decades ago, you kind of felt a lot of those first-generation folks, which probably weren't the folks 
so affluent that they you know would not be wanting to work while they were, were in college. So I think it's true across the board. So if there's a difference of where it's at, I think it's true of all uh, you know the, the uh, better universities, better colleges that are seeking to bring in students from around the country and around the world. They're probably bringing in students who are either you know more taken care of either financially or, or by scholarship or whatever. So I think that's true across the board. Um, but I think it's generally true that there are the students that are coming are, are certainly more affluent than they were in the past um, across the board of the U.S., if that's what you're asking. I, I think also, you know, we, uh, the Asian population here is so diverse, right? So we did address um, the student population, but I think that um, maybe to a lesser degree, we're attracting those that are coming in, you know, in the service industry. Right, and so um, is that a problem? I think that maybe workforce-wise, I, I had heard, not, not just for the Chinese restaurants, but I, I heard that this is a problem for the restaurants, right, industry in, in Pittsburgh, period. Right, so if restaurants are the city's top employer now, and I would say you could go into any restaurant and they will tell you that we're in a, we, there's a dearth of workers to pull from, and we don't have the culinary school that we used to have downtown. And so it's not just, I mean, that's going to be restaurants across the board. They'll tell you that they're hiring people to work on the line that have never, they don't, they haven't used knives, they haven't worked in a restaurant or what have you. And that's, that's just where we are right now. But that doesn't mean that, you know, the restaurant industry is the only industry that makes up the Asian you know, workforce here, right? And, and not just that with the students. In Squirrel Hill, we're also seeing um, you know, um, global trade you know, um, um, uh, offices that are setting up. Um, we have some that are um, accountants that are coming in. Um, we have bakers, you know, there's, a, uh, there's two. There's a, a Sumi's Cakery, so it's Korean. Um, and then across the street is um, Pink Box, right? The Taiwanese, um, yeah, bakery with like, I think, you know, Portuguese, French, you know, sort of um, influence there. So there, there's other, you know, pieces that, that make up for that. Um, but at, at the same time, I think that because we have so many universities, that is our biggest draw of, of this. And that's probably why we hear that a lot more. Does that help? Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. We're so glad that you're here, and we really hope that you're still hungry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A big thank you to Mike and Everyday Noodles for sharing our story with us today. If you haven't gone up to get your bowl of Everyday Noodles, be sure to grab some before you leave. Visit Everyday Noodles Restaurant located at 5875 Forbes Ave, Squirrel Hill, open seven days a week. The city of time thanks you all for coming, for upcoming programming. Yeah, thank you, thank you. But my, my, my best advice is Chinese always say, if you don't like that person, tell him go to open a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you enjoyed tonight's programming and you'll join us again soon. Thank you and good night.